time now to take a look at the week that was. Let's take a look at the top stories that made headlines across the globe this week. And we'll start off right here in Nigeria, as the Central Bank of Nigeria has announced new minimum capital requirements of 500 billion naira and 200 billion naira for commercial banks with international and national authorization. The Apex Bank further unveiled a new capital base of 50 billion naira for banks with regional licenses. According to the CBN, all fresh capital requirements are to be satisfied by the 31st of March 2026. The central bank also pegged the new minimal capital for merchant banks at 50 billion, while non-interest banks with national and regional authorizations are mandated to raise their capital thresholds to 20 billion and 10 billion naira, respectively. Earlier in this week also, the Central Bank of Nigeria's Monetary Policy Committee, the MPC, increased the benchmark interest rate by 200 basis points to 24.75% from 22.75%. A RISE News correspondent, Nkechi Nana, was at the briefing and will tell us more. <laughs> At the second Monetary Policy Committee meeting of 2024, Nigeria's Central Bank unveils a series of pivotal decisions, including raising interest rates for the second time in a matter of weeks to cool inflation. Decisions of the MPC. The committee's decisions are as follows. One, raise the MPR by 200 basis points to 24.75 from 22.75%. Two, adjust the asymmetric corridor around the MPR at plus 100 to 300 basis points, to minus 300 basis points. Three, retain the cash reserve ratio of deposit money banks at 45%. Four, adjust the cash reserve ratio of merchant banks from 10% to 14%. And five, retain the liquidity ratio at 30%. With inflation soaring past the 30% mark in annual terms, its highest in nearly three decades, the bank keeps tightening its grip on monetary policy. Governor Laiami Cardoso highlights the committee's resolve to combat these price pressures with expectations set for a moderation starting May. The considerations of the committee at this meeting focused on the current inflationary pressures and the need to anchor inflation expectations as well as ensure sustained exchange rate stability. These considerations underscore the importance of the CBN's commitment to the price stability mandate and the need to urgently bring inflation under control to ensure that purchasing power of ordinary Nigerians is restored in the short to medium term. In addition to the interest rates, Governor Cardoso articulates the committee's broader economic strategy, underscoring the bank's stance on several key issues currently shaping Nigeria's economy. With respect to the foreign exchange forwards, we determined that a number of these transactions did not qualify, and I've said this before. Um, in some cases, you had some requests which, well, you actually had some allocations that were made in millions of dollars which were never requested for. You also had some where they had no foreign, where they had no Naira and they were also allocated, you know, huge sums of foreign exchange. And the list goes on. And it was for that reason that we refused to validate those particular transactions. We refused to validate them. Because, you know, apart from the fact that documentation was not satisfactory, in many cases, they were outright illegal. 
We have been consistent in saying that we will withdraw from direct interventions. The fertilizer that was given out was the residue of an intervention that had been done before we came. Well, that is not a surprise. As we know, the Central Bank of Nigeria Governor, Mr. Yemi Cardoso, had hinted at recapitalization program coming, um, I think, earlier in November of last year. So this program is not a surprise, I would say, to members of the banking sector. I do think that regular Nigerians will be worried about what this means for them. You know, what does it mean for me if my bank has to raise its share capital? And for most people, their funds are safe. And I'll say for everyone, you know, the CBN has set out that their funds are safe. The Nigerian Deposit Insurance Company does exist to make sure that consumer funds are safe. And for what this means also for the banking sector, the idea behind it, obviously, the theory behind it is that if banks recapitalize, if they have a stronger capital base, then it would help them borrow more money. And that is necessary because the CBN also increased our interest rate. Um, they've increased the interest rates again in order to fight inflation. But with an increase in interest rate, as you've quite kindly pointed out, <laughs> businesses suffer. Yeah. Businesses suffer. And so it seems that in order to try and curb some of those sufferings that the businesses are seeing in their fight to fight against inflation, they're trying to now recapitalize the banks to hopefully provide a stronger capital base so that banks are able to lend more. And that is, of course, what we see in theory. That is what has happened in other jurisdictions. In theory, yeah. you know, it is, you know, It has happened in other jurisdictions. We've That's seen correct. it happen in practice. But I do think that the Central Bank of Nigeria and the CBN governor, Mr. Yemi Cardoso, is positioning himself to make very active moves but again, we need to see how effective that would be on a lower level to yeah. the retail consumer. Yeah. And obviously, there's also that issue of job losses in the mm -hmm. banking sector. Absolutely. And I, I, I doubt we'll see much of that on the tier one banks for the bigger banks, such as, you know, Access or GTB. But when we do get to the more regional or retail um, level banks or the merchant banks, we might see some mergers some acquisitions and some job losses. Yeah, yeah. you're very correct, uh, this way. I mean, there, I mean, a lot of things to unpack there, uh, but at least uh, once you applaud the fact that uh, the CBN on them, Mr. Yemi Kaduso, is not docile. Yes. You know, they're speaking out, and, and, uh, and, and the governor himself seems to be speaking the language uh, that people uh, will want to hear. They may not necessarily agree in totality yeah. uh, with what he's saying, but at least he's, uh, he's consulting and he's speaking to people. Uh, so a few things to unpack there. Uh, starting from the rare, um, I like the fact that uh, uh, the CBN uh, is consistent with his argument about who deserves to get paid mm. the backlog you know, of the dollars based on verifiable documents. Yes. You can be making claims for hundreds of millions of dollars that you never requested for. I, I thought that that was an important thing. Uh, Mr. Cardoso has been... Uh, very articulate, you know, and consistent about his argument. And I think that if you stick to his gun, uh, it shouldn't be um, um, outwitted by anybody, particularly Definitely. those uh, foreign airliners. Definitely. Who keep, who Definitely. Keep, you know. <laughs> Try to hold his leg to the <laughs> fire. Absolutely. And, and now we see how they are all running elter skelter, mm. adjusting the prices that they claim, you know, have been issued that could not be adjusted just because Epis, Epis, which of course, you know, had his uh, beautiful inaugural flight earlier this morning. You know, on account of that, I think that the CBN should maintain its position transparently, as transparently as possible. Uh, the issue of the NPR, I mean, you know my position yes. on that. Um, <laughs> um, we have not addressed uh, the main cause of inflation, particularly the, you know, in the area of food inflation. Yeah. And we know the aspects of uh, this government's policies that uh, brought us to these uh, undesirable, you know, for want of a better word, uh, position. Uh, but of course, like I said, uh, CBN will not fold his arm and keep quiet, and yeah. therefore he will have to arrest the situation because the pressure, as they say, you know, out there <laughs> is getting, getting worse, worse. <laughs> 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 on practically, you know, everybody. So when you raise NPR from 22 uh, to 24, uh, you know, 24 plus, 
uh, yes, that will have on paper, you know, uh, textbook knowledge of it. It will have an effect in at least trying to slow down inflation. But at the same time, what happens to SMEs and the real sector, you know, the manufacturers who need money constantly to borrow money? What happens to them? How do you pay back uh, at 24 Doesn't, point yeah. something percent? I mean, that's like, you know, businesses will, you are, you are practically strangulating uh, businesses. It's a tough call. Uh, uh, but we're hoping, like he said, that on the long run, that on the long run, uh, maybe things will improve slightly. Because once the real sector is affected, it comes down to practically everybody. And I, like I always say, uh, it is still the same CBN that has, that has not found a solution to the, the trading of Naira, Naira notes. You know, as bad as it was in those days, it has continued. So the owners of the money, you and I, go to the bank. You need how much? 20000 50000 small little money, you know, in cash you couldn't get. It's not about getting uh, a mint. You can't even get the cash. But then you go out there, under the tree, or at a party, bills of them being sold to you. Yeah. You don't have the money. Paying 10000 12000 15000 on top of a 50000 I, I think that those are the type of things, in addition to what CBN is doing, that they should try and find solution to. But for the consolidation, bold and audacious, yes. I will say. Um, of course, it will have its merits and demerits. Um, given the fact that it's, I think the last uh, exercise was in two, 2004, the 25 billion recapitalization. I mean, this is a long way from 2004. Uh, and therefore, I, I think the banks knew that it would come to this mm. point. Given that only last year, under uh, the uh, what, what are the small banks uh, are called? Uh, <coughs> like the regional merchant banks? Or? No, the, 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 little, the little, little ones. Microfinance. The microfinance yes. banks were asked to you know, recapitalize and they were given a yeah. target. So I like the fact that if CBN is saying at least it would take you know, a minimum of two years for you to get ready, for you to look for money, but what, what all this will lead to will be mergers and acquisitions and, and stuff, the type that we had under Governor Soludo, I believe, yes. or was it under It was uh, uh, under Soludo, under yeah. Soludo. No, no, I think it was under, yes, Soludo. It started with Soludo. It started you with know, Soludo, The consolidation so, of, yes. of the banks. Yes. Uh, that will happen, and, and that will also, of course, address the, you know, some of the concerns that you raised uh, in terms of job losses. Mm. Uh, this is where uh, the aspect of insurance Hubs will in. be key. Yeah. And all this is going to the fact that the president is targeting one trillion dollar economy. economy. And I, I mean, do I that's, love that. That should you be said, the direction. Yes. In fairness to them, that should be the direction. I was going to say that I love that you keep emphasizing that it's a tough decision because I do <laughs> I want to give credit to the CBN yeah. governor. I think Mr. Cardoso is making tough but necessary mm -hmm. decisions, and I hope it works out for the best of all. We of all us. hope that it works out. Yes. All right, we'll move on. Uh, the Nigerian army has handed over 131 Kuriga school children freed from abductors to the Kaduna State Government. The general officer commanding one divi division of the Nigerian army, Major General Misunero Saraso, during the handover, said six of the students are still undergoing medical treatment. Our rights correspondent, Nisi Gabriel, has more. The released Kuriga school children arrive at the government's house accompanied by soldiers. One by one, they emerge from the military vehicle adorned in new attires. While presenting the school children to Governor Obasani, the general officer commanding one division of the Nigerian army, says the school children were released through kinetic and non-kinetic efforts by all the security agencies. Through the sustained and coordinated application of both kinetics and non-kinetic efforts by the security agencies under the strategic guidance of the President, Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, President Bola Ahmed Tinubu, Grand Commander Federal Republic, through the Office of the National Security Advisor, the abducted Kuriga school children have over in the early hours of yesterday, Sunday, 24th March 2020, safely rescued after spending about 16 days in captivity. 
the students were initially received and administered first aid at the Nigerian Army Troops Forward Operating Base at Tansadao Forest in Zamfara State. Physically present during the handover are 131 school children, while the military say six of them, including a male and five females, are still undergoing medical treatment. We successfully freed 137 students and pupils who were abducted. When you add the staff member that died, it gives us a total of 138. But here this afternoon, I have physically present before you 131. that is still being attended to medically at our medical facility in Dalet Barracks with five other female students who are also being hospitalized. Your Excellency visited them last night and he saw all of them, including those that were lying on hospital bed. Governor Obasani says the circumstances surrounding the release of the school children shouldn't be speculated. He cautions insecurity merchants to be careful with their utterances. A lot of people have been spending a lot of time coming with permutations on how these children were released, what happened. For us in Kaduna, what is more important is that several thousands of our children were happy they are here with us. That is more important. And I want us to please continue to support our armed forces and the entire security agencies in our own country. They are doing extremely well. The governor reaffirmed his earlier position on the number of school children abducted, saying it is 137 and not 287 as widely reported. These children here, when I met them, they admitted to me that 138 of them were kidnapped, were abducted. And they also admitted to me that 137 are here back, only one person was lost. So that is the reason why I want to draw our attention, particularly the media to be careful and to be cautious in the way they report issues of insecurity in Nigeria. Some, most of us even believe some people are jubilating when there's insecurity. What kind of a country do we have? Politics is politics, but insecurity should never be politicized. On March 7th, these school children were abducted by terrorists in Korega community within Kaduna State during school hours. Now that they have been released, the Kaduna State government says they will undergo psychosocial support before being handed over to their parents. Nisi Gabriel, Arise News, Kaduna. All right. I mean, one week after Adesua, uh, we're still um, trying to of so the number of people um, that were abducted, number of pupils and students that were abducted and that returned. But it looks like the military uh, is saying that 137. The governor confirmed, uh, like one of the returnees said, that one person you know, was sadly you know, uh, lost. Uh, so it is no longer 287, but 137. I mean, like every Nigerian has expressed, you know, we should be happy and grateful uh, that, they, uh, that they have been found, mm. you know, because it looks to me like we're not even sure of the, of the type of expression to use. Um, safe return, they were, you know, safely rescued, they were this <laughs> and that, but I mean, uh, you know, it's a bit opaque, you know, in terms of um, how their uh, freedom, you know, was, was, was gotten. And, and like many people have also expressed on social media, at what point did he, you know, were they able to all of a sudden, get the Ashwabi, you know, the, <laughs> you know, the Anko, as, as people would say, you know, ready for 137 people uh, to come to uh, the government house, you know. And this is not like an accusation on anything, but uh, I think what people are saying is that um, let's be clear about what is going on so that um, we won't go through the same route that we have always, you know, gone through and when it comes to people, especially a large number of people being abducted and then being returned. Yes. Uh, if all this is just to say that no ransom was paid, okay, was there a fight? Did you attempt to 
uh, apprehend any of them? Where did this happen? Is it in Zamfara? Is it in Kaduna or where? You know, there is a bit of opacity in all of this. Uh, it's not helping matters, but as I said, you know, Nigerians are grateful uh, that these uh, uh, that the hapless children, children are back. Uh, yes. So I, I think I believe that these set of children, from my understanding, were the ones who were taken to Zamfara because originally before they were found, the governor had said that they had been taken to neighboring states. Now, but it's, it's also very unclear because the <laughs> language that is being used as, a result, as a regarding the number of children, as a regarding the operation, whether it was a rescue, a release, whether it was an intelligence gathering mission yeah. that ended up with them exactly. being found. And the issue that we're having, and I think an issue that the governor might not fully understand, is that people need to trust their government. Exactly. People need to know that their government is telling them the truth. Yeah. The only way they can do that is be, being transparent, mm -hmm. clear communication, yeah. and consistent in that communication. Yeah. I think actually they, they should take a, a note from maybe Cardoso's book in that because, Car <laughs> because the, the communication <laughs> has been not consistent. Dealing with, he's not dealing with, he's not dealing with, with, with that. <laughs> However, I do want to say because the governor did you know, have an interview where he said, the military said, or the, you know, the military said to him, or the security services, my, so apologies. Security services had said to him that no ransom was paid and he believes them. That for me is not actually giving me confidence in what you're saying. And more importantly, how do we prevent more mass abductions Absolutely. from happening? Yeah. Especially knowing that our children, our children, the future of this nation are the key targets right this, now. This, this, you know, uh, returnees will go back to the same school without fence, without security. It's, That's part of the point. Yes, it, and it's, it's part of the, the problem. Beyond uh, the Ashurbi, as you've mentioned, <laughs> we need to secure our schools. Now, let's move on to our next um, story for today. We are going to Senegal, where Senegal's opposition candidate Basiru Diomaye Faye has emerged victorious in Sunday's election, securing 54.28% of the total votes. That's according to official provisional results released by the Electoral Commission. The former Prime Minister Amadou Ba of the ruling coalition, Faye's main challenger, garnered 35.79% of the votes with a voter turnout of 61%. Fire's win is poised for confirmation by the Constitutional Council after the deadline for appeals by the presidential candidate expires on Thursday. Mr. Fire has pledged to govern with humility, tackle corruption, and address issues such as youth unemployment and the high cost of living. His victory marks a new chapter for Senegal with expectations high for Africa's youngest democratically elected president. That is true. At just 44 years old, Mr. Fai is poised to become the youngest president on the continent. And I think that the for youngest elected the president. youngest <laughs> elected president, my apologies, yeah. on the continent. And I think for African youth, it does show, I, I think it has been inspiring a lot of people, but mm -hmm. we also need to also look into the fact that he is in a sense, a stand-in candidate for a godfather who could not he's, run. He's an accidental. <laughs> he's an know, accident. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Two weeks ago, he was in prison. He was in prison because he was supporting, I believe, Usman Sanko, who was the opposition candidate that had been barred from running. And so I want to say, though, it does show the power in a popular movement. It just showed that democracy can work if everybody is engaged. 61% of Senegal came out to vote. Yes. And they, according to the results, one the overwhelmingly... One of, the, one of the best in Africa in yes, recent times. Yes. Yeah. So it, it does show that democracy is not something, especially, I think, for me, it motivates us in Western Africa when we see a democracy that even if... And a candidate that a lot of people did not know, mm -hmm. Senegalese people did not know a year or two mm -hmm. ago, is now their president, mm -hmm. a tax inspector who lost his mayoral elections just two years ago is not president of a country and he's never, you know, he has not held elected office before. And I, I found it very beautiful in that sense. Yeah. Now, what that is going to translate into, yeah. we wait to see. I am always optimistic, mm -hmm. especially when there's a young person at the helm. Now, yeah. how, how much of that power he's going to share with Usman Sanko's, we, we, we wait to see. But it does... For me, especially when it comes to this democratic 
experiment that people have been talking about, especially because of the coups that we have seen in the western part of Africa over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. For me, this is a bright light for all of us Absolutely. because it does show that if you key into democracy, the president tried to postpone the elections, which we spoke about, you know, and he was fought by his people. His people came out to the streets and his people came out to the ballot. Yeah. And now he is no longer their yeah. president. Yeah. I yeah. think he's handing over by Thursday, or yeah, it's a very correct. quick transition. It's not even <laughs> like Nigeria, where you have about three months, you know, after <laughs> a declaration. So for me, it shows that there is value in democracy if the citizens are active and they don't let up. Absolutely. I mean, that's the beauty of, of what has happened uh, in Senegal, that lead to beautiful uh, uh, country, neighboring country of ours in West Africa. Uh, I, I think what, what has happened to... Uh, to fight uh, uh, is, 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 is almost, is confirmed by that funny expression that we use in Nigeria, what God cannot do <laughs> does not exist. <laughs> does not exist. <laughs> Two weeks ago or 10 days ago, he was in prison, not sure of what would happen to him. Yeah. He came out and then protest votes, basically, largely protest votes, particularly from the youth, you yes. know, uh, uh, and, and, and that catapulted him into presidency. Uh, I think that there's a lot to learn from what has happened uh, in, in Senegal, uh, you are very correct that this is about, it's a good day for democracy. Mm. It means that democracy can thrive in Africa. It also is, is a validation of the youth power. Yes. That people can come out in mass uh, and everybody will almost go in one direction. 54, uh, more than 54% of the vote uh, is victory, is emphatic. And I like the fact that Macky Sall and even the Prime Minister who lost against him were quick to congratulate him. Yes. Uh, I hope that um, uh, it will go beyond uh, uh, ruling or, or governing with humility alone. You know, it takes a lot more than humility and it takes a lot more than be uh, a tax collector, mm. you know, to, to, to govern a country like this. And like you said, how you now relate with Sunko, uh, who many people might say, is it the godfather? <laughs> <laughs> or the In backbone, our parlance, or yes. The backbone, or the backbone, yes, but, yes. But because of the coalition that brought him in, the labor unions, the youth movement, the mm. teachers, you know, the students, it, will, it cannot afford to disappoint them. Yeah. And I think that um, uh, uh, it represents a ray of hope, mm. you know, for that part of Africa, you know, that is yearning, you know, for youth power and for democracy to be at work. Uh, France will be slightly jittery, you know, given the position of Sonko, you know, on how uh, a former colonial power will have to deal uh, with um, a country like Senegal. So... Uh, he might not be wearing a military, a military uniform like uh, uh, his, his colleagues in Mali and Burkina Faso. <laughs> but in terms of uh, philosophy yeah. and values, you know, you think I, I think that Senegal will be ready to yeah. say that, you know, that there must be little that France you know, we'll be bringing down on this. Well, like. Francophone Africa is, I think the Afrique part is getting stronger <laughs> than the Francophone part. So <laughs> we, I'm excited to see how that is going to play out. Well, me too, me too. that's all on the week that was. However, there are a few other stories making the rounds today. And first of all, we're going to talk about America, because despite increasing pressure from high profile Democratic senators and members of Congress to limit military aid to Israel, the White House has signed off on another routine transfer of bombs and warplanes. It amounts to about $2.5 billion, not only for fighter jets, but also in support of the bombs that they would carry. It comes despite a growing rift between Israel and the US government. Earlier this week, the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu abruptly cancelled a planned meeting between the U.S. and Israeli officials that was to review Israeli military campaign plans for a ground invasion into Rafah. And here in Nigeria, a traditional ruler named by the army as one of the suspects wanted in connection with the killing of 17 soldiers during a peace mission in Delta State has surrendered to security agents. The OVA of the Ewu Kingdom in the Hugeli South local government area of Delta State, Clement Ikolo, said he was surprised his name appeared on the list of wanted persons and that he was innocent. He described himself as a devoted Catholic who will never get involved in the killing of a human being. The uh, news that came out this morning to say I'm wanted, I'm on my way to the police to declare my innocence to the police. I know nothing about this heinous crime. 
Uh, I'm the traditional ruler, yes, I'm the traditional ruler of a Urubu kingdom. However, I know nothing about it and uh, I'm going to the police to turn myself in. Well, that's all we can take from news making the rounds.